So Super Clutter is an art and science organisation currently based in Margate in Kent in the UK and also in New York. Uh, we've been curating different types of events across London, the UK and worldwide since 2006. We also have a publication called TEN by Super Collider and it looks at the last 10 years of projects by Super Collider. Um, and you can find out more about it on our website and also purchase it there. The next episode we've got coming up is with Professor Roberto Trotter called The Language of Stars. And Professor Trotter will be talking about his amazing publication, The Edge of Sky. The Edge of Sky describes the universe using the 1,000th most common words in the English language. Uh, Roberto is kindly donating his share of the fee to the Help Musicians Corona Hardship Fund. You can find out more about that event and book your ticket on the Super Clutter website. So we really want to get you guys asking questions to our speakers. So as we go, if you'd like to ask any questions that you've got in the chat box on the right hand side, after each speaker has finished, we'll, we will propose these questions to the speakers and we can start a conversation like that. So tonight's event um, asks, are there other life forms in the universe? Humanity regularly sends information from Earth out into the universe that may be picked up by potential or extraterrestrial intelligence. Should we be sending such messages? And if so, how do we represent ourselves in such messages? In searching the universe, what do we find out about ourselves? So Dr. Jill Stewart explores into her research that covers sending messages into outer space and listening for messages from outer space through SETI and METI systems. So after the talk tonight, Paul Hill will be speaking about how the tides on Earth and the movement of the moon are intrinsically connected through tidal locking. What is the moon and where did it come from? How has the moon affected life on Earth and how has it influenced our human evolution and culture? Is the moon crucial for life on our planet or could we survive without it? So after Paul's talk, we will look at the crescent moon and to end, Paul Hill will show the moon on a live stream through his telescope. So just a bit of information about our speakers. Paul is an elected fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, co-presenter and writer of Autumn Astronomy podcast, a space ambassador for ISERO, and has appeared on BBC News and radio to discuss a range of astronomy and space issues. Dr. Jill Stewart is an academic based at the London School of Economics. She specialises in the politics, ethics and law of outer space exploration and exploitation. Dr Stewart is a trustee of METI International, an organisation that focuses on sending messages from Earth to potential extraterrestrial life. She is editor-in-chief of the journal Space Policy and was 2015 recipient of the British Science Association's Margaret Mead Award. So as Louise said before, if you have any questions during the event, just put them in the chat and we'll read them out to the speakers afterwards. Here we go. So, um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and also messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. And I'll go through what exactly we mean by the difference in those two things. As was introduced um, already, I'm at the London School of Economics, and I'm also involved in METI International, which is Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So that's an organization that is working on trying to contact extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm not actually editor in chief of space policy anymore. I was up until very recently. Um, <clears throat> that's now been handed over, but I'm still on the board of uh, advisors for that particular publication. So a lot of what I do is more kind of mundane if, when it comes to space. I'm not sure anything is mundane, but sort of looking at satellite regulations and why different countries have space programs and so on. But one of the other things that I do is to look at um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. So what I'm going to go through in the next sort of 20 to 25 minutes is I'm just trying to see if I can get this little box to move. No, I can't. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be looking at what is extraterrestrial life and then what is SETI and I just realized I haven't actually hit present on this so it's not giving my animations. There we go. So 
Um, what is extraterrestrial life? What do we mean by extraterrestrial life? What do we mean by life? So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Then what is SETI? So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and then METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Then I will talk about, I'm not sure why my prompts are, okay. Does extraterrestrial life exist? So what makes us think that there is extraterrestrial life out there? That we should be trying to reach out to. Then I'm going to go through a, briefly the history of what information we have sent out into space already that could be picked up by any sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that's out there. Go through a bit of the moral and philosophical discussion about whether or not we should be sending information out about us now. And then finally end with just a, a sort of philosophical question about the future. <clears throat> But to start, what do we mean by extraterrestrial life? So when we're thinking about whether or not there might be life out there on other planets, I think a lot of us have this idea of sort of the little green man, um, slightly humanoid, intelligent, but actually part of what we're looking for is potentially just like bacteria or cellular life or microbial life. And if we were to discover that on another planet, I think it would affect the way we might see it in terms of whether or not we would land there. Um, and colonize it, for example. But that's sort of the most basic level that we're talking about. The next level is sentient. So if something is able to perceive or feel things, but not necessarily intelligence, the best analogy here would probably be how we think about animals on this planet. And I'm not entirely sure I agree with the way we kind of categorize animals as being lesser than humans. But, you know, this is the idea that they can feel things, um, but they don't necessarily have the capability to have intelligent thought. The next level is intelligent, <clears throat> intelligent thought. And then the one additionally that people don't usually think about is if it might be robotic. So if we look out the planets and we assume that a potential other species would have evolved in a similar way to us, we are increasingly combining ourselves with technology. If you just think about how reliant you are on your phone, for example, but I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that we may increasingly blend ourselves with technology. So if we were to encounter a civilization that's much more advanced than us, there's a decent chance that they would be at least partly robotic. <clears throat> so the question there is, how does that change how we might interact with them, what our moral obligations are to them if they aren't, um, in any part biological or only partly biological. But those are the sorts of things that we're looking for. And this is just a nice painting that's actually from the 1500s of a cyborg, essentially. So we have been thinking about these sorts of concepts for a long time, but now we can think about applying them to outer space. Next question, what is SETI and what is METI? So SETI, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and METI is messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. And there is a bit of a divide within the community of people who work in this area around which we should be doing and when and which we shouldn't be doing. So um, a really simplistic way to think about it is that if that's us on the earth, SETI is listening, right? So we're searching for extraterrestrial intelligence by looking out and seeing what can we hear, what can we see about other planets, but it's really a passive process. Whereas METI is very active. So that's the act of messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, sending messages out. So that's just a, a, a drawing really to illustrate what we're talking about here. So should we be doing passive versus active SETI? And there's a big debate about this. SETI, who does SETI? Really anybody who has a telescope, who can look up at night, think about um, extraterrestrial intelligence. It's not an exclusive community, if, if you will. Anybody can do passive SETI and listen for potential extraterrestrial intelligence if you have some of the technology that you would need to do so. I think people often associate SETI with the SETI Institute, which is based in California. And they bring together a lot of different research networks to really focus efforts in a scientific and methodical way on trying to seek out extraterrestrial intelligence. And then these networks, yeah, are based around the world. Um, a lot of professors, for example, at different universities who are involved. And also, you know, the public can, has been involved in the past in some ways in SETI in terms of pooling our resources to think about and look for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. That's the logo for the SETI Institute. So METI is this, uh, um, proactive way of actually sending messages out. 
So messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, who does this? Well, NASA has very much done this in the past. Uh, and I'll go into a bit more detail on this in a minute, but in terms of placing information on the space objects that they put into space that would tell potential extraterrestrial life about us as humans and planet Earth if they were to be intercepted. So they've been involved in it. My organization, METI International, were involved in thinking about what messages to send out and how to go about doing that. But I would also say that I think it's important that this is a broader discussion this is partly why I like to do presentations such as this, because we like to engage the public, because it's a question that involves all of humanity. And so it's something that I think we all need to collectively think about and share. And that's our logo for um, METI, Me Messaging Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So next, does extraterrestrial intelligence exist? Or even just extraterrestrial life on that sort of scale of what we mean by life that I introduced? Um, <clears throat> I personally think that there is a very high probability that there are other life forms in the universe, and most scientists tend to think that as well. Um, if you think about, um, the, well, there's something that we talk about within this SETI and METI, which is this idea of anthropocentricism, the idea that humans are so important, we're the only life that has evolved in the universe. So sometimes it seems a bit eccentric to think Yes, there is life out there, but I would actually flip that over and say it's eccentric to think that we are the only life that's out there. It's actually much more likely that we are one of a number of different species and life forms that have been evolving in the universe over time. This is a cosmic calendar. I won't go through it in too much detail, but just to, um, you might want to look it up. There are a couple of different versions of these, but what it does, which I think is useful, I think it's really hard for us as humans to conceive of both time and distance within the universe. And this, what they've done with this, is to take, if we were to say the entire universe was actually just one year, right? So a concept that I think humans are much better at grasping, if, if the universe were one year, okay? So the Big Bang was January, and we now exist on December 31st. Well, it, it's really interesting because if you look at it, it's not even until December of that year that mammals and dinosaurs come onto the planet in the scope of the entire universe. So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, November, sorry, we're talking about gradual evolutions of different universes, but it's not until December that life on Earth starts to evolve in the way that we might know it. So the dinosaurs would be sort of around um, the first third of December. And um, really the process of apes and monkeys splitting and evolving into what we understand of being humans today doesn't actually happen until the last day of December. So that's how we fit into the overall universe. Like humans are actually just this little blip so far. And I don't say that to sound negative, but it is what it is. We really haven't been on the scene for that long at all in cosmological terms. So then if you go into the final day, this final day of December, you can break that down in terms of hours. So humans would have started walking around 9.30 in the morning. Um, and would have migrated in the way that we're familiar with now in the last minute of the calendar. And it would actually be in the last minute that we start to see things like, you know, the Bible being written, um, agriculture being developed and so on. So that's just to try and give you a bit of a perspective as to how we fit into this overall universe, which leads on to my next point. Does extraterrestrial intelligence exist? I think it likely does. I think it's arrogant of us to assume that we would be the only life that has evolved um, on Earth otherwise. And some of you might be familiar with the Drake equation. I'm not a hard scientist. Um, my PhD is in philosophy and international law, but this is sort of the scientific equation for calculating the likelihood of there being life on other planets and suggest that it's quite high. Having said all of that, people are often surprised, given that I work in this area, when I say, I don't think we will make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. 
I don't. Um, and it's partly because of this distance issue and partly because of um, time frame. So like I said, the cosmic calendar is the time frame issue. We are only really just a blip so far in, in the entire um, cosmic memory. Uh, but then also um, we, in terms of distance, I think the likelihood of us being able to actually make connection with another species that has lived in the same range of time is very low. I was going to show a brief clip from this particular video, um, but given time constraints, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm um, assuming, oh, you know what, I will post a link to it in the chat after I'm done and when Paul is on so that you guys can see it. But basically what it says is, you know, this is where, this is where Earth is and what we can see with our telescopes is here and our galaxy is here and our galaxy is just one galaxy and an entire universe. And it just puts into scale how vast the universe is. And I think, you know, humans aren't really evolved in a way to understand that, be able to conceive that. But if you can try and get your head around it, it just gives me reason to believe that we're very unlikely to actually make contact as long as humans exist. I'm kind of making some assumptions about whether or not humanity will manage to carry on. But, you know, I just think it's about being realistic in terms of scale. Having said that, I obviously work in the area and I still think it's very much worth doing for a couple of different reasons. First of all, because if we could make contact, that would be brilliant. But secondly, I think the process of thinking about making contact and what we would say and sending messages out is a worthwhile uh, endeavor in and of itself. So going through the philosophical process of thinking about what we would send out, for example, is, is a project that's worth doing. So I still very, very much believe in both SETI and METI, but if I'm really honest, I, I don't think we'll make contact. Anyway, so what have we been sending out up until now in terms of, I'm just checking my time, okay, I think I'm okay, in terms of what we have been already sending out into the universe. So there are two things that we really talk about. One is unintentional stuff that we've been sending out. And the second is intentional stuff, messages that we've been sending out to extraterrestrial intelligence. But I think a lot of people don't realize that we have unintentionally been sending a lot of information about us for a long time, if there were to be extraterrestrial intelligence that we're looking at planet Earth. I mean, for one, one of the things that we look for when we look at other planets is whether or not, for example, we can sense that there are life forms that are consuming um, oxygen and creating carbon dioxide. Um, so if somebody were looking at our planet, they would be able to see that. So there are sort of scientific indicators that we're here anyway. But in addition, we've been leaking information since we've started working in radio broadcasting television broadcasting, radar, um, shortwave communications, and so on. And then in particular, once we've started having satellites around our planet that communicate with each other. So all of this information potentially leaks out into the universe, which would make us detectable. I put up a picture here of Hitler. I shouldn't laugh. It's not funny, but one of the, um, we assume that one of the most deeply penetrating messages that we've potentially sent out into space one of the earliest was actually Adolf Hitler announcing the start of the 1936 Olympics as, one, as a way of demonstrating technological power. Germany broadcasts that um, via um, television waves. And so that is actually out there in the universe. So if somebody were really following us, there's an idea that the first thing they would receive from us is Adolf Hitler opening the Olymp Olympics. But so all of these things come off of our planet and make us potentially discoverable. And conversely, these are the sorts of things that we're looking for when we do the search for extraterrestrial intelligence on other planets. Yes, it assumes that they would have evolved in a similar way to us. It's, you know, the best that, that it's one of the best ways that we know to start at least. And then in addition, we have also been doing intentional um, messaging. So I'm just going to put up a, a a few examples and there are many more but one of the best known is perhaps the 1972 and 1973 pioneer plaques so these were 
um, um, objects that were sent up by NASA in the United States. And fairly last minute, they decided to include information about humanity on the objects in case they were intercepted by extraterrestrial intelligence at some point. And Carl Sagan in particular was involved in deciding what to put on those. These might be familiar to use. These are the ones that, um, that were put on the Pioneer um, spacecraft. There was a long discussion about how to present the humans and it was decided that the um, higher ups at NASA would be uncomfortable with the genitals being more specific than they are. So they've, you know, kind of been a bit vague on that. You can also see on here, this is a map so that if you can interpret the science behind it, you would be able to find Earth afterwards. And so these have gone out and are out in the universe, potentially able to pick up. Um, we also had the Arecibo message in 1974, excuse me, which was sent out and broadcast and again contained a message that if if we base on the assumption of our own understanding of intelligence another intelligent species would be able to recognize that there was a data rich um, message being sent and then once they interpreted more behind that they would be able to find a lot more information about us for example our dna and also where the earth is located so that was sent out um, you also have things, Cosmic Call, I would encourage you if you're curious about the details on these to look these up, but these are different things that have been done by different space agencies and also non-governmental organizations that we've been doing for a while now. The WOW response, the WOW signal was a signal that we received at one point which nobody has yet been able to interpret exactly whether or not it could have potentially been sent from extraterrestrial intelligence. So we did broadcast a response out um, in 2013. So that's just a summary to give you an idea. So we are unintentionally sending information out and we are also deliberately and intentionally sending information out. And those are some examples of the things that we're doing. Now, just checking my time again. Uh, yes, okay, we're not too bad. So. The next question is this big ethical question about whether or not we should be doing the intentional side of things. So there are some people who say we should only be doing passive SETI, not active METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. And there are good arguments on both sides and I recognize those. I obviously have my own position on that, but I recognize that there's a worthwhile debate going on about this. Some people obviously say no, we shouldn't be sending messages and some people say yes. In terms of no, there's a lot of people who believe that extraterrestrial intelligence may be hostile. Uh, I suppose if you go on the basis of our own evolution and how we treat other species, for example, there's an assumption that if they needed something from us, if we announced where we were, they would be able to come and destroy us, for example. Sometimes you hear the analogy that we would be a, a, an anthill and it wouldn't affect them to crush us if they had the capability to do so. There are also people who think that um, you know funds should be spent on listening rather than sending messages out. So just prioritizing budget. And the really extreme end of this no argument, no, we shouldn't be trying to make contact, is the idea that we should hide under a rock. And um, again, with regards to the leakage, people who are really far down the line of this argument suggest that we should try and rein in all of the leakage that we have and restrict any possible information that would be going out about us and about planet Earth. So sort of try to retroactively rein in that leakage. In terms of yes, um, so no surprises, this is where I'm at. I think we should be sending out messages. Part of the reason, again, I said, I don't think we'll actually make contact. So I think one of the things that's worthwhile is that it requires us to think about ourselves and to learn about ourselves. So we search the universe to discover ourselves. And um, so I think that has value and merit in and of itself. Secondly, um, if they can contact us, I think we can make an assumption that they have been around a lot longer than we have. Again, if you think about the cosmic calendar, maybe they've been around since March and we're, you know, the last 30 seconds of the last day of December. In which case, they'll probably know a lot more than we will about, for example, um, environmental degradation and the greenhouse 
gas situation, climate change, how to get through that. And so although the people on the no side think that they would well hurt us, I would like to think that they might actually help us. We could also add in viruses there, perhaps. Um, you know, they will presumably have been around longer and know more about these things than we do. So I would like to think that they could help us rather than hurt us. Um, and I would like to think that we shouldn't assume that they will be more, uh, that they will be violent just because that's what our um, evolutionary history has been. So, you know, on the yes side, there's this idea that they're likely benign. Um, they might be able to help us with things such as the environment. And if we could make contact with them, then it would allow us to become an interplanetary species. So when we talk about space travel, we talk about, they sometimes call it the lifeboat scenario. So if planet Earth were to be damaged um, beyond survivability because of our own behavior or because of something like a comet or an asteroid, which of course killed the, the dinosaurs and many other major species, um, extinctions in the past, then we would need to be able to be an interplanetary species. So if we could make contact, it would give us that reassurance. So for me, I, I think it's worth the risk, but there are definitely different arguments about this and, you know, it's a discussion worth having. Um, just in case people are curious that on where other people fit on this. Um, no, Elon Musk is very, very much against us trying to make contact. And in fact, has been involved in, this is way too small and I know you won't be able to see it, but what it is, if you're curious about it, look it up, it's called the Berkeley Statement, I think. And it's something that a group of scientists came out with a few years ago saying, we feel really strongly that we shouldn't be trying to make contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And Elon Musk was one of the signatories on that. He's really, really against it. Um, Stephen Hawking is, is a bit interesting. I, it was said that he was against it, but I've also heard that maybe that was a bit misinterpreted. This is a, an article where he says that, yes, it could be risky, but it's worth something that's worth doing anyway. On the yes side, Carl Sagan was very much in favor of making contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. Brian Cox, um, Bill Nye, Bill Nye, the science guy, if any of you know him, I'm not sure Bill has publicly come out um, as in favor, but um, he's, I think actually, I, I think he has. Um, Martin Rees is the uh, Astronomer Royale for the UK, and he's very much in favor. He's, he agrees with me that he doesn't think we'll make contact, but in that case, what's the harm in listening and sending messages out? That's from a personal conversation with him. I'm not sure what his official line is, but um, Andrea is an astronomer who was married to Carl Sagan, and she's very much in favor of this. Doug Backock is the um, director of my organization, METI International, and he's a really interesting guy. He has a PhD in interspecies communication, and um, he's obviously in favor of that because that's what our, mess, our organization does, and he has a great TED talk if you want to hear more about that in terms of thinking, he talks about thinking about what we would put in the messages. And then of course me. I am aware of time. I'm going to speed up a little bit here, but I am getting through the last of my slides here. So if we are going to send messages, the next question really is what should we be sending? There are practical considerations. So how do we communicate with another species? Um, how do we let them know that this is a coded intelligence signal rather than just the usual noise that we have in the universe. So how to get their attention, essentially, again, if they're robotic, does that change the way they might communicate and so on. So there are a lot of practical and kind of scientific technical questions to address. And then um, also how to say where we are, how to give a map back to Earth, if that's something that we want to do. And then the area that I'm more involved in really is the philosophical considerations. So what would we tell potential extraterrestrial intelligence about ourselves? Um, do we want to whitewash our history um, or go with sort of warts and all? And, you know, there's some people who say, just send them the internet and they'll know everything about us. But do you know what, do we want them to know everything about us? Or is it silly to try and hide things about us? Um, so these are, are really um, important questions, I think. And they all come down to, at the end of the day, us trying to think about who are we? 
and how do we present ourselves and, and how do we want to do that? So, um, second to last slide here, big questions for the future. I don't have answers to these and I'm always curious to hear what other people think, but things that we talk about within this industry. So should we be sending messages? As I said, if so, what should be in them? Um, there's also a question about regulation. So who should we be trying and regulating what people send out? Because as technology becomes more accessible, you know, your neighbor, actually, I think my neighbors are listening in tonight, <laughs> your neighbors could be sending a message out. Um, you know, are we okay with that? Or should we try and restrict that? Um, you know, should we regulate who has control over the messages that we're sending out or just leave it open? And finally, um, one thing that we don't really have a clear answer on is contact protocol. So if we were to be contact, what would happen? Um, the United Nations has an Office of Outer Space Affairs, and there's somebody who's in charge of that. She was on the board of um, advisors for the journal when I was a, a um, the editor-in-chief for space policy, and there were rumors that the United Nations had decided that she would be the diplomatic representative for Earth if we were to have contact made, but she told me that that was rubbish. Um, I think it was just a story, but, you know, we don't know who would it be a, con you know, would countries kind of lock down and decide that they want to be in control of who's communicating or should we have a single representative that represents all of us and so on. Big questions that we really don't have answers to. So that's um, everything. I'm going to end here just with a quote from Carl Sagan. I sometimes try and come up with something better than him, but he's so good. Why would I try and compete? Um, so of course he was a hard scientist and an astronomer, but he did write one science fiction novel, which was Contact in 1985, which was made into a movie. And at some point, this is a spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, at some point they actually make contact with um, another interplanetary species. And what the alien says to the main character played by Jodie Foster in the movie is, um, so see, in all our searching, the only thing we found that makes the emptiness bearable is each other. So I like to end on that because again, it reiterates to me that, yes, I think we should be doing all of this, but a lot of what we're doing when we reach out is to look back in. So we search the universe to discover ourselves. Well, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk, Joel. Um, we have our first question from Professor Roberto Trotter. Do you think robotic AI life forms have the same rights as biological life forms? Such a good question. Um, and I have presented about this in Vienna with the United Nations Office of Outer Spaces. I mean, this is a question really about artificial intelligence. And again, this is why, although it's a question about out there, I think it also reflects back in. I personally feel that if they have evolved to the point where, even if they're entirely robotic, if they still have, you know, moral capacity and sentience, although this is where it gets tricky, because how do we define sentience? then yes, I think we would have the same moral obligation to them. And I think we should think about ourselves. Again, this is kind of the direction that we are headed in as a species, if we manage to survive this um, stage that we're in, viruses and environment and whatever else. I think it's, it's, it's probably likely that we will increasingly combine ourselves with technology. So, um, you know, I would like to apply the same empathy that I would have to a future human who is robotic to um, a non-Earth-based robotic presence. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, that is a much bigger, I think it's a great question. I would love to know what um, he thinks as well, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is really a discussion, a wider discussion that we're having right now about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So our second question is from Anna Marie Barker and she says, do we know how far our messages reach? Also a really good question. So interesting. Um, 
so I, again, I'm not a hard scientist, so I can't say in terms of like the leakage, I think it does dissipate as it goes out. One of the things that I'm interested about is, so the Voyager spacecraft had um, a replication of the Pioneer plaques that I showed you guys. They had those on them as well. And those were meant to just go out and take images of the planets as they went past them. And they didn't really know how long their shelf life would be. Um, but they lasted a lot longer than anticipated. And so they actually got to the edge of our galaxy within the last 10 years, I think, and left our galaxy. And we lost communication with them at that point. So where are they? I, it gives me chills, actually, to think about it. Um, you know, we don't know. The chances of them being intercepted and picked up are, are so small. I mean, talk about a grain of sand in an ocean, like the, the chances of them being intercepted. But um, so yeah, so um, yeah, so there's, there's the, I, I suppose, another way to put it is there's the physical messages that we've sent out. So like the plaques and the disks that are on our spacecraft that have gone out into, now literally into the universe, since the Voyagers have left um, our galaxy. And then there's the digital information that we leak. So radio communications, not even necessarily leak, we intentionally have sent messages out as well. And all of that has to do with the size of the, um, of the, why can't I think of the word of the, of the telescopes that we're using and, and how much we concentrate the message um, in terms of the signal. So, you know, it can be more concentrated and go a bit further or more, um, a disparate, but then it won't necessarily penetrate as far. But that, that again, that's my understanding. I'm not a hard scientist. So um, yeah, that's kind of my understanding of it. Okay, that's great. So Roberto made a comment. Thanks for your answer, Jill. I wish we could discuss it over drinks at the end and me too, so much. <laughs> yeah, September, sign me up, we're there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got one more question from Isadora. What if extraterrestrials use communication technology that's totally different to radio? Are there other alternative ways to send messages? Such a good question. And this is something that we do think about within our organization. So it's really about, and again, this is why I think it, it, the, the project is, has value in and of itself, even if we aren't gonna make contact because it forces us to think these things through. Yeah, we're assuming that if there is extraterrestrial life out there, it's carbon-based, it's evolved in somewhat of a similar way to us, you know, has a brain of some sort. I mean, maybe we're completely wrong. Maybe they are, there are some people who have speculated that they're nano, you know, so they're teeny tiny, or all of these other different ways of existing that if you leave the anthropocentric mindset, become possible and, and open. So, I mean, I guess what I would say is, we're going off of what we know. <laughs> um, and what we know is that that's how we would communicate. That's what we've sent out. That's the best we, we know to listen. But it really does kind of start to stray into the realm of science fiction, but we're always trying to think about, yeah, different ways of looking for communication. If they were nano, would we know that if they had made contact or if they were even here amongst us, or, I don't believe they are, I'll just say, but yeah, it's, 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 I suppose it's path dependency in that we assume that they have developed in a way similar to us. And part of the interesting philosophical challenge is to try and take yourself out of that mindset and think about how they might be different and how they might communicate differently. Um, but for now, we are focusing on the, um, the technologies and the um, monitoring systems that we are familiar with and that we feel capable with. But they're interesting questions. Okay, so that's, oh, we've got one more question. Uh, from Jim, 
Due to the lag of us sending them and receiving, how do we ensure the message is appropriate for our future generations? I wish I had an answer, and this is a lot of what my organization does. So we organize people to get together and talk about this. Um, I don't have an easy answer to that. Um, like I said, what do we want to tell them about us? I think it's, you know, do we, do we edit out the Holocaust? Do we edit out Ebola? Um, or do we just tell them, you know, potentially who we really are? What's our responsibility, as Jim said, to future generations? Really, really complicated um, and philosophically really important, but I don't have any easy answers. And, you know, like I said, I think there are good debates on both sides. I myself waffle back and forth between thinking, you know, let's send a more sanitized version of ourselves to thinking, you know what? No, they will presumably have been around longer than us. They can handle knowing about us. And, you know, maybe they even would have had in their own history, something similar. Um, but I, it's, it's not, it's not an easy question. And yeah, it's not just about us living right now. It's about future generations and what's going out. The one thing I would add to that though, is we've been leaking all of this information for decades anyway. So the degree to which we can potentially control that message, I think we shouldn't necessarily overestimate that. So that gives me a little bit of weirdly, a little bit of, um, comfort because it's already out there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do think we should be thinking about what to send. And I don't, I don't have any easy answers for that. It's a great question. We've got lots of great questions. So Hannah asks, how have we communicated so far in terms of language? Which languages have been chosen for communications and how are they selected? Great question. I love that one too. Yeah, a lot of what we send out tends to be more Western centric. So um, the pioneer discs that were sent out had hello in all of the different languages of the world. So trying to include that diversity. I think there's no denying that a lot of it is English centric because, you know, NASA have been the ones that have been sending, you know, had the capability to send out the probes. So there's definitely a bias there. Um, I myself have been targeted. Um, because I raised some questions about whether or not we should be representing um, both the genders and also the um, cultural diversity of the earth more um, in what it is that we're sending out, which is a question that Carl Sagan was very concerned about when he constructed the, the pioneer plaques. Um, so yeah, I have talked about that. I got, oh, I got some really nasty um, articles written about me and you know got trolled and um yeah that was not <laughs> not the best experience that was around 2015 i really got a lot of hate mail um death threats and all the rest of it but um you know i think it is something that's worth thinking about so why do we assume that it's english i think right from my point of view if i can justify why we primarily operate in english it's just a practical matter of needing to talk scientifically about how to send messages out. One of the things that we do is project prime numbers because if somebody were listening, that would demonstrate intelligence, hopefully. And a lot of the scientific global community operates in English. So that's not an excuse, um, but kind of is what it is. And I think, it, but I think it's something that we need to keep thinking about and working on because if we are communicating who we are, again, if it gets intercepted, but if it doesn't, as we collectively philosophically think about how to represent ourselves, I think it's really important to recognize human diversity and you know that we have all of these different languages and um, yeah, that whole, the whole complexity of us. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of it right now gets, gets conducted in English. Okay, um, that's really interesting. We've just got one time for one more question from Caroline Denholm. Oh, yes. What, what do you think is the most important thing we can learn about ourselves in SETI and METI search? Oh, 
that's a sweet that's actually my sister-in-law so hi Carolyn <laughs> <laughs> um, and believe it or not that's not a conversation we've had <laughs> over dinner parties and whatnot um, what's the most important thing that we can learn about ourselves I actually feel a bit emotional thinking about that um, I suppose this gets into morally ambiguous territory but what we've done right and what we've done wrong um and then how we how we represent ourselves so um what well, you know what okay let me let me let me pull that back first of all i think there's practical things we can learn so interspecies communication really interesting anybody who has a dog or a cat or a, a, a bird you know you do this like we do communicate with each other and one of the things that we're doing is to very practically think about how we would do that with another species from a different planet and so practically and scientifically i think there's really interesting research to be done there also things like thinking about how we would send out a signal um this goes back to the question that came before about how far our signals are going like how we scientifically target certain um planets and so on and what information we would include in that in order to get people's attention so i think there's interesting scientific work to be done there but then there's the philosophical one and i don't know I'm, i might sound a bit soft on this and some days i i don't feel this way about humans frankly but if i'm in a good mood i kind of think we underestimate the degree to which we are together in this and that's why i ended with that last slide and all of searching the only thing we found that makes the emptiness bearable is each other so we spend a lot of time fighting with each other but in reality maybe the only thing that we have is each other and in i suppose what is there's a saying something like um to make a friend to have a collective enemy like we're so used to seeing each other as different groups, but if we zoom that out and look at us as a species and what another species would think of us, I think it forces us to consider the elements that we have that are part of our shared humanity. Ugh, I don't know, maybe tomorrow somebody will make me mad and I'll be like, no, <laughs> I don't feel this way anymore. But you know, on when I'm feeling optimistic and positive, that's sort of what I, hope we would be able to get is to think about what we have in common and what how we would then explain that to another species. That's a really um, interesting thing for everybody to think about, I think. Thank you so much for your amazing talk. Um, I'm sure everybody at home would love to clap as much as I do. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jill. Amazing. So next we'll be hearing from Paul Hill and he will be speaking about tides on Earth and the movement of the moon and how they're intrinsically connected through tidal locking. And then after that, we'll have questions. And then following that, we'll be having a live stream of the moon, um, which would be really cool. <laughs> Hello there. Hello, Look, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting a, a, a quarter phase. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here in Wiltshire in, in the garden. I've got the telescopes out here and I've got the beautiful sunset just over here to the uh let's can everyone hear me okay yes brilliant right hello right then so let me share so i'm going to do a little bit of uh let me just move that out of the way there we go let's drop this on the floor there we go right so move this over here right then so um this is, um, I always start with a, a, a good old science fiction thing. I'm a bit of a, a science fiction fan. Um, watching that talk just now, I, I always think of a, a Fred Hoyle book called A for Andromeda. Um, and A for Andromeda, Fred Hoyle was a very famous um, astronomer back in the, the 50s. And he, he coined the term Big Bang, even though he actually didn't like Big Bang. Um, and he wrote a book, a novel called A for Andromeda, and it was, he, Kind of put this put this idea that we we would we'd hear from aliens, we'd hear from another civilization, um, in this case from Andromeda, from the Andromeda galaxy. But the way that they would would communicate and, and spread 
was by sending a message about a machine and they would build a machine, uh, send this sort of design of a machine to build. And on Earth, there's a big debate about should we build the machine? And eventually they do, and of course the machine takes over. Um, and it's the way that this, this, this race spreads across the universe is by sending out the designs for a nefarious machine that all the various civilizations end up building. Um, but anyway, so I, I start with a, a bit of a bit of science fiction. This is Operation Luna, which of course, if you uh, you know your uh, science fiction, this is the early British science fiction from BBC Radio back in the fifties. Uh, Journey into space with Jet Morgan um, going off to the moon and finding time travellers on the moon. Um, so the moon, the moon is a uh, a fascinating object, um, and we'll, we'll have a look at it later on. And there it is, uh, a beautiful image just of, of the clouds sitting up in the stratosphere. Um, and it's, a, it's an object, I'm going to talk about um, some of the culture first of all as well, and, and sort of a, a mix of culture and science, uh, and the kind of art of the mood and things as well. Um, and it is an object that clearly is, has always drawn human attention. It's very difficult for it not to draw human attention. Um, and of course, it, it's one of the first things that astronomers ever looked at. Um, through telescopes and in fact you're, you're probably all immediately if you, if you know anything about the history of telescopes and astronomy you're saying oh Galileo actually Galileo was beaten to to looking at space through a telescope by um, Harriet who, uh, who was a, a an English um, astronomer um, he was an English scientist in general and um, was on various expeditions during the Tudor period to go to North America and he beat Galileo actually by about three months um, and these are the very first drawings um, taken of the moon through a telescope um, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. Some of my favourite drawings from, from astronomy history of, um, and of course it's it's uh, something that's, that's fascinating it's in literature. Um, H.G. Wells, he's the, the first men in the moon, um, travelling in their their bizarre Victorian capsule um, across to uh, our neighbour, and of course we did actually go eventually, um, and. We're currently celebrating, we've just celebrated the, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13, the, the failed landing. But we, we, we've been there, we've been to the moon, we, we've got a much better understanding of it, and um, a lot of the, the, the things I talk about later on, some of the evidence, um, is because of Apollo. We, we know a lot about the moon and how it came about and formed and, and what it's made of, because we've been there. It's the only place in the universe that humans have been other than the Earth. Um, they can never know to sort of understate that really that that, that object at the moment just sitting up there um, in the eastern sky is is the only other place that humans have ever been and we went for a very short period um, and then we've not been back hopefully we'll be back soon um, Artemis 3 is going to be the mission with any luck um, so um, the man in the moon or the man on the moon um, it's modern modern sort of parlance we, we think of that um, sort of paradolic image of uh, the image of the, the face of a man on the moon so there's a, the one of the very first science fiction films ever created a French film um, for the Voyage de, de la Luna um, and in 1904 if you want to look it up it's actually a really good film um, and it's sort of it's, it's about this image you know the image of the man on the moon so our image of the moon but actually if you go back sort of before the 20th century and the 21st century actually is about the man in the moon and in fact it's, it's not surprising there are a lot of pubs in Britain called um, the man in the moon because actually in, in very long-standing English tradition and, and folklore the man in the moon is actually the god of drunkards um, a sort of great cultural um, sort of you, you, well it's England isn't it and, and there's even a poem there's even a, a, a sort of a, 17th century poem um, about it. So it was, it's about the, the drunken man in the moon. So our man in the moon drinks claret with powder, beef, turnip, and carrot. Um, if he doth so, why should not you drink until the sky looks blue? Um, so yeah, in England, of course, the uh, is, is the uh, the god of drunkenness. But there's lots of there's lots of mythology about the moon. Um, and of course, a, if you'd actually go back to sort of the, the pre-19th century and that parabolic image of, of that, that face on the moon. Actually, this is what we mean by the man in the moon in Europe in, and the sort of Germanic cultures, so including Britain and uh, sort of Northwest Europe, really. It's this man here, and actually it's a, it's a biblical image because this is the, uh, the man gathering wood. He was the woodcutter 
that's mentioned in uh, in the Bible who breaks the Sabbath and um, he collects wood uh, when he sh really shouldn't be. Um, it's in Numbers, I think, is, is, the, is the, the biblical book. And he gets punished, uh, and he's punished by God for, for breaking the Sabbath. And he, he's there on the moon. There he is. Here is our, that, that is the image. If you go back to, say, like the Tudor period, this would be the, the image that, that you would get of the, the man in the moon, of, of the, 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 the Sabbath-breaking man gathering his wood. Um, of course, in, uh, across the other side of the world, we talk about the, 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 the culture of China. And in China, it's the goddess Changi. Um, and the goddess Changi, who is the goddess of the moon, and she's stranded on the moon after taking one too many doses of an immortality drug. Um, and so she's then sort of stranded on the moon with um, Yutu, uh, who's the moon rabbit. And here is Yutu, the, the jade rabbit of the moon. And interestingly, the, the Chinese probes that have been landing on the moon recently, and there's one on the, the far side of the moon at the moment, a rover, is, is they're called the Changi probes. The Changi probes are the very first rover that, that's went out onto the surface of the moon, the Bay of Rainbows, uh, the Mare Imbrium, look at that later, um, is, was called Yutu, named after the, the Jade Rabbit. So, um, and then, um, of course, if you're an American astronomer and the JFK Observatory in the 1970s, it's a, um, you can see a basketball player putting a ball over a baby. Yes, um, essentially you can make any parabolic image you like out of, of the Mare. Um, and of course, that's, that's what we're talking about here, these uh, well, the science, that paradolic image, of course, is the Mare. These are, um, they're called Mare because, of course, they're, they're, they're Maria, they're the seas, the seas of the moon. So the first early astronomers um, were kind of thought they were seas. They didn't have telescopes. They assumed that they were bodies of water or liquid. And, and of course, very quickly after the telescope was invented, this was disproved. But the name stuck. So... For instance, we, we can see most of these tonight, and you've got the large one there, the Oceanus Procolarium, uh, Mare Imbrium, where the Chinese landed their lander, and there's, there's that bay at the top there, and the, the top left of it for the Bay of Rainbows. And of course, you've got Mare Tranquillitatis, uh, the Sea of Tranquility over there on the right. Um, and that's where we humans first landed on the moon, so you know, it's a special place in human history. And then what are they? They're, they're, they're sort of very curious things. In some respects, they weren't wrong. Astronomers, the early astronomers, were not wrong about them being seas, but they weren't seas of water. They were actually seas of lava. And this comes from about, about 3.9 billion years ago, where these, these impacts, these, these huge, huge impacts, um, there's a thing called the late heavy bombardment. Uh, well, they, they, that's coming into doubt at the moment, but there was certainly a bombardment of objects anyway. Hit the moon, and they, they hit them so hard that it actually broke through the surface. And the moon was still active at this point, and the lava wells up and fills these craters. And then, of course, it sets. So you've got, when you look at the moon, um, if I sort of go back to that image, the, the light grey stuff, that's the, the kind of if you like, the original surface of the moon. We call that the, the lunar highlands, especially to the south of that image. We can see the, the crater Tycho there, named after Tycho Brahe, uh, the Danish astronomer. And this is the sort of more mountainous, more lumpy, bumpy, older surface. And then you've got the darker pattern. They're, they're much more, well, in astronomy parlance, more modern surface. They're 3.9 billion years old, but they're less impacted. They've got less craters on them. It's been resurfaced. And that, that's what those are. So they're actually giant impacts uh, created by massive asteroids and comets that slammed into the early moon. Um, of course, there's lots of cultures that are, are, are kind of hold the, the moon dear and this is Aztec this is an Aztec moon dial um, and it's about a, a really horrific story as you can imagine the Aztecs love the horrific stories and uh, this is a uh, Koyalaxacu uh, and Koyalaxacu is the uh, high priestess's daughter who um, plots against her own mother and turns all her brothers on her mother the high priestess and they, they attack her pregnant mother because they think their pregnant mother's going to have a, another, another baby that's um, going to usurp them all. Um, and it's, it's all stopped by the, the, the person who is the, the kind of key character in Az Aztec culture. Um, how does it to po Pocatilli? I can never ugh, I'm going to get my tongue around that one. Um, and he, uh, he's, he's kind of like the key person in, in Aztec culture. Um, and as you can see in that image, um, his sister is, um, well, She's not in one piece anymore. 
which explains all the mare on the sea and their her various body parts and things like that. It, it's a pretty horrific story. Um, and then, of course, uh, North American uh, culture before before the, the Westerners turn up. And there's a whole other argument about um, you know um, SETI and things like that. It's about you know just look at human experience of um, of how we go out to places and the Europeans went out and when we arrived in new places we we um, contacted other other groups we weren't the best we we were more, more like the Martians in H.G. Wells frankly but um, there's there's various you've, you've probably heard lots of these like um, the the pink moon and the wolf moon and things like that they've, they've been coming into British newspapers of, of late and actually it's quite a recent thing in, in British astronomy but it comes from North America and all these moons the, the sort of cycle of moons through the year um, have these sort of meanings. So the wolf moon was was this point when when there's no food, and so the wolves are, the wolves are howling and they're hungry, and it's the time of, of starvation. The, the wolf moon goes with a, this sort of dark time in the winter. Um, so there's all these different names for the, the, the things, and that's that's come from from the culture of North America. Um, then um, there's the uh, Maya goddess uh, Ishel. Um, she's great. Um, she's, she's the goddess of gestation. Um, and interestingly, she has a rabbit companion as well. So on two sides of the Pacific, we have two cultures um, with a princess on the moon with a rabbit. Interesting. But this one didn't take an immortality drug. She's actually the um, goddess of midwifery and gestation. And we think it's to do with the, um, the misassociation with, with the lunar cycle and the... Um, women's cycles basically and the, uh, this about sort of the month period and things like that it, 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 there's no evidence that's that's actually true and it's probably coincidental but in a, in a pre-scientific culture the, the link is, is kind of obvious in a way when you think about it but there we are um so um there's that and then the inuits um in, in the far north in the arctic going right round of course you know, various Inuit related cultures um, across across the north of the globe. Um, very similarly, the um, is this sort of shaman very important, and this is a mask, a shaman mask of the moon, um, and it's Algarak, um, who's there, the sort of god of the moon, is the god of weather and, and water and tides and eclipses. Because actually, because because they're a very water based culture, they realise that the moon is something to do with the tides. In fact, they're one of the very earliest cultures to probably realise that the tides and the moon are linked. Um, um, and then, of course, there's the famous John Lewis culture um, of the last few years, where um, for some bizarre reason they, they've imprisoned somebody on the moon um, and can only be communicated by a small child, um, or can, can only assume what the religious significance is um, and what kind of horrible thing this man has done to be, to be put there by John Lewis. Um, but um, we can speculate. Um, of course, one of the most obvious um, cultural uh, references to the moon, of course, is, is Islamic culture and, and, and uh, various sort of Muslim groups. And um, actually, what's really interesting is that there's sort of two two parts to this this moon uh, moon reference in, in Islam. And one, of course, is on the left the, the symbol of the moon and the star. And this is actually probably more to do with the Ottoman Empire um, than, than Islam itself. So that's why it's the flag of Turkey, and it, it crops up. But actually, it's not really an Islamic symbol before the Ottoman Empire sort of takes over. And it's only really a symbol in parts of the, the sort of Middle East and, and Mediterranean where the Ottoman Empire was. The other reference, of course, is the moon being split in two um, in, in the Quran and this idea and, and there's sort of various you know, philosophical debates about what this, what this means, because clearly the moon has not been split in two. But it does, it's interesting because we're um, looking at where the moon comes from. And of course, we, we now know through Apollo and through our observations of the surface and, and the Apollo program, we know that the moon has come from a collision with the early Earth. So here's an image of the, the early Earth being hit by a body we call Thea. Um, and we very recently, uh, various German institutions found in the Apollo samples the traces of this, this Thea. So we know it existed. We know another big body hit the moon. And what it did is it destroyed itself and blasted a big lump of the Earth off. And uh, sort of here's a, here's a nice little computer simulation to um, entertain you. Um, and we think this, this sort of, all this stuff went into orbit around the Earth. And this, we're talking about very, very early days of Earth. Um, and for a while, Earth would have had a ring system like Saturn. You can see it forming here. Um, and then um, 
the, this stuff starts to coalesce under gravity and form actually moons. Now there's lots of debate about how many moons the, the, the Earth originally had because there's a lot of material up there. And so actually initially hundreds. Um, and then it, we think it formed probably two. So it's kind of an interesting coincidence, this sort of comment in the Quran about the, uh, the, the moon being spitting two. Because there's a really interesting thing about the moon. And it's part of the reason it's tidally locked and it's part of the reason that um, the moon looks different on two sides. So we have our image of the moon with a mare. And we talked about that, there, the, the, uh, the parabolic image. But there's a picture on there on the right of the far side of the moon. And the far side of the moon was a big surprise. When, when the Russian probe Luna 3 went behind the moon and took the first image, the first time humans had ever seen the moon from behind, um, it was a big surprise because actually it looked nothing like our side of the moon. And what we've discovered is the far side of the moon, if you look at that, that image on the left, uh, the far side of the moon is actually thicker. It's got a thicker crust, a much thicker crust. And we are theorizing, and this is one of the things the Chinese are doing on the far side of the moon at the moment, is we're looking at this idea that a second moon, a smaller moon, probably about 750 miles across is, 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 is thought to be. They're not a very big moon. Basically slammed into the back of, of the moon and sort of pancaked itself on, on the, the, the far side and created much thicker crust which means anything that hit it never really broke through so if you look at that image there are some sort of hints of, of slight mare there but basically nothing could punch through the thicker crust and we think it's because another moon splatted onto the back pancake like um so tidal locking is, is fascinating because the the moon um you, you've noticed the moon faces us the whole at the same time all, all the time it's the same side of the moon looking at us and this leads to this idea that the moon doesn't spin it doesn't spin around like the earth does well actually it does it kind of has to in order to do that and so it it's spin it's always say it's tidally locked and this is to do with with the tides on earth so um i skip over to that at the tides of course here's a, here's a picture of a, a port and you can see it tied in tied out and What's doing this is the gravity of the moon. On the large bodies of the Earth, of water, the moon, the gravity is, is pulling the water towards it. Um, and then you get a, a sort of reversing where there's a sort of lack of gravity and, and, and it, it raises as well. And so you get your two tides. So as the Earth spins through those tides, it appears that the water sort of comes in and the water goes. It's actually, we're passing through that bulge. So right now, the, the, the moon's over there, there's, there's a bulge of water that, that you know, Europe and everything's passing through right now because the moon's above us. And, and that will be our high tide. And then we'll pass out of it again. But that bulge essentially is, is kind of staying in the same place you know, and, and the earth is kind of passing through it. So when you're standing on the coast watching the tide come in, it's not really coming in. It's the water going up and of course as it laps in, as it kind of comes over the edge, but actually, it's just we're moving into that bulge of water, which is a really mind-blowing way of thinking about how tides work. But what this does as well is the tides do the same thing to the moon. The gravity of our oceans, which are huge, pull on the moon and they, they grabbed the moon and slowed its spin down to the point where it's one face that faces us. And if you think about going around and trying to face, if you if you I do this with children, but if you, if you stand up and try and orbit your chair and keep facing it, you'll have to keep turning to keep facing your chair. So the moon turns in the same amount of time that it takes to orbit. So it has a, a sort of 27 day orbit and it spins in 27 days as well. And so what that means is it always faces the same way to us. Uh, but of course presents a different face to the sun. The sun, if we were kind of parked ourselves where the sun is, and saw Earth's moon, you would see all of the moon through a month because it's spinning and you would see the rear of the moon and then you'd see the side of it and it would come around you see as it went round the Earth, you would see all of the moon. So actually if there were aliens on, on Mars, they would have seen what all of our moon looks like long before we did, um, until we sent Luna 3. Um, and of course, um, the image there on the, on the right is an, another issue about tides that is, is really fascinating. Oh, and the kind of this, what has the moon done for us? That's the tidal range, the intertidal range there. You've got the kind of 
um, creatures on a rock and you can see where the low tide is and the high tide is and the different types of animals there and what's really fascinating about them is the idea that the tides have driven evolution so it's the moon that's driven evolution on earth because we, we know life probably started in the seas or always certainly started in the seas and so as life got to the surface of the seas it's having to contend with the tides and if it's clinging to that rock twice a day it's exposed to really corrosive oxygen nor the radiation of the sun and then it's covered up again and it's to a different degree so if you look at those layers of, of different creatures on that rock and there's a reason they're layered up like that is that these creatures can take that exposure to air and exposure to water and exposure to radiations at different levels so the ones that are clinging down by the low tide mark they're the ones that we really don't like being out of the water very much the ones at the top of course can take long periods of time being in what's actually a very very corrosive oxidizing atmosphere um, and expose all that sort of uv and in, infrared radiation and things from the sun but it, it it's driven evolution they all survive that they have changed and that's probably what drove evolution on earth especially in the early days um, and that's all down to the moon and the moon of course has done something else for us we have we have seasons and that's because the earth is tilted over and that tilt stays in the same direction as it goes around the sun. It doesn't, doesn't wobble, like sort of change position. It, it's always pointing in the same way, going round and round the other sun. And what's fascinating is there are other planets that do this, but they, they actually do a spinning top effect. Now, if you look at Mars, Mars actually has about the same sort of lean over as us. But Mars's pole will slowly move over and wobble like a sort of spinning top over just a couple of thousand years it, it, it's, it's really unstable because it hasn't got a big moon we've got this really big moon that's really powerful gravity has been pulling on our tides and pulling on our land there's a tide on the land i mean when the moon's overhead right now the land you're standing on there's a moon overhead is about 60 centimeters higher than it was earlier today when the moon wasn't above you interesting fact um it's helping to keep the earth geologically active but it's also stabilizing our wobble. We have a wobble, but it takes about 26,000 years to progress round in its, in its circle, about 26,000 years, which has meant that the seasons and the weather on Earth is actually amazingly stable. And it's not something that when we've looked at other planets and the, the geology of those planets and the, the climate of those planets, of Mars and Venus, and things like that, we don't see that stability. And again, this has allowed life on Earth to flourish because stable climates and, and the weather system staying the same for very, very long periods of time mean that life has a chance to, to kind of change and evolve and, and, and become something different. So the moon, culturally, really, really kind of deep and meaningful to, to all of humanity um, and, and has driven religion and, and kind of our art and things like that. But actually, it's also crucial to our existence and and crucial to kind of everything we do um, on earth the, the, the knowledge of the tides our ability to travel around the world everything's all come out of our sort of the moon our what it does for us and our, our understanding of the moon. and there i shall stop amazing that was so interesting thank you very much no problem there we go uh, 20 minutes exactly look oh amazing would you like to answer we've got one question so far would you like to answer sure. that or would you like to go over to the telescope I'll, tell you what, I'll get the telescope on and i'll put the thing on there you can ask me the question at the telescope so give me a moment just to mute this so i don't um i'm just going to mute this okay everybody time to think of your questions for paul Hmm. Good question. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. Yep. We yes. Can hello you. there. You can hear me. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share. Um, no, deny not that one. I want to share. Um, oh, no. Let's just go with that. Um, so I'm going to move my telescope now. Oh. And then, right. So what's the question? When I when I move 
this onto the moon and Okay, first question is from Anit. What are your thoughts on the Artemis program? Can we, should we justify the spend on the level needed to get back to the moon? Oh, it's a great question. Um, yes, oh God, yeah. Um, the, the, the moon is, um, there's lots of reasons. I mean, it's, it's the old, it's, it's actually a part of a bigger argument, isn't it, about whether we spend money on, you know, telescopes and amazing astronomy or do we spend it on healthcare and things and of course right now that 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 seems like a bit of a no-brainer doesn't it um you know should we be spending buying telescopes or, or buying ppe but in the bigger picture um we should go back to the moon. we absolutely should go back to the moon um because we like as i hopefully was getting over in the talk it, it's so fundamental to the to the human experience and it is the nearest thing we can go out and touch and and learn about and explore it's it's an it's it's the first bit of the universe we can actually put feet on and pick up and do experiments on and try and understand where where it all came from where the um sort of um you know, the solar system was formed and things like that all our things like the, the, the whole thing about fear and how the moon was formed we only learned that by going there until astronauts actually went there and picked rocks up we didn't know that and in fact until really apollo went we weren't even sure the craters were impacts and not volcanoes and things like that so we learned so much and we're still learning so much about it and actually the, the the technology we got out of apollo is incredible um just incredible amounts of technology and um the, the stuff we live with every day stuff in your house came out of the apollo program it said that for every dollar they spent on apollo they got about eight back so if, if that works with artemis every every dollar they're going to spend on artemis we're going to get you know loads back in return it, it, it you can't you can't kind of we can't just sit here and look at the thing we've got to go and explore it we've got another question by anne-marie barker she says do yep. Do we understand why Earth and the Moon have the relationship that they do beyond positioning? Do we, do we understand the, the relationship they have? Um, oh, well, I mean that that's kind of it, really. You know, in a sense that um, there, there is it's a big lump of rock. There it is. That's that's our um, that's our body that's, that's orbiting around us, and the relationship we have is is this thing that gives us light at night. It has given us all sorts of mythology and, and religion and great great stories. It's also um, stabilised our, our rotation. It's allowed the seasons to happen. It allows the tides to happen. It's driven evolution. There's all sorts of you know theories about. Let's say I, I mentioned it briefly there about the the kind of idea of um, women cycles. That that's the classic one that comes up. That it's to do with the moon. Well, if it was to do with the moon, every woman on Earth would basically have the same cycle as, as, as you know it would time with something to do with the moon and its position and things like that and, and it, it isn't the case <laughs> so, and, and it's been looked at this is this has been looked at um and actually there's been lots of research done especially back in the sort of 50s and 60s about you know are the various cycles of reproduction and things like that to do with that well in, in terms of humans no but actually it might be a throwback it might be a throwback to because there are creatures that are the, the cycles are controlled by the moon so you look at coral for instance the, you know the, the coral spawns on full moons and things like that so so there is it, moon does have an impact on biological life whether the fact that human the human reproductive cycle has this sort of you know essentially 27 day cycle which seems amazing coincidence with the moon um might just actually just be a, a throwback in evolution um so um yeah that's but I don't know, is there any more to that question? That sounds like it needs a follow-up question, that one. Well, we've got quite a few questions coming, actually. Um, so Lisa Pettibone asks, has the moon always been tidally locked with the Earth? No, it wouldn't have been. No, um, in the early days, it would have rotated faster. It would have also been closer. Um, if I say it, would have, it would have fallen a lot, lot closer, and tides would have been enormous. If you had been, um, you know, sort of back, in the, the kind of Devonian period and things like that, the tide would have been two, three times higher than it is now. Um, and in fact, go back even further, and you would have actually seen the land tide. You'll have seen the ripple 
come across the land um, as, as the land is sort of pulled up in the very early days. Um, and it's slowly drifting away. We know, again, from Apollo, there's an experiment done every single day um, where there's a reflector that Neil Armstrong put on the moon and we bounce a laser off of it every single day which is an amazing feat in itself. And we know from this, this reflector, this retro reflector, that the moon is moving away from us at five centimeters a year, which is, um, doesn't sound much, but if you think about it, multiply it by your lifetime, um, that is a long way. Um, and certainly in your entire life, the moon will be a lot further away than it was uh, when you were born. Fabulous. Uh, we have another question. Yeah. Uh, just scrolling up. So this one is from Chinooki and she says, great talk. Question, what causes a tidal bulge in Earth's oceans on the side of the Earth opposite to the moon? Uh, it's, it's the sort of, um, it's, it's a weird bit of geometry and, and, and mathematics, but basically the kind of um, lack of pull. Um, it's like a sort of sympathetic um, it's a harmony thing in, in terms of um, you, you it, it's difficult it's really difficult to explain there's actually a really great experiment I can show you about how you spin something and it, it does the same thing basically um, we can do it with elastic bands spinning around your finger um, but you it, it's the you get the, the the bulge under the moon and then you get a, a sort of sympathetic bulge on the other side where there's there's nothing pulling on it kind of falls away in a weird sort of way and it, it, it's a bit of a lag thing um i'm trying to without without a visual to, to demonstrate what i mean it's quite a difficult equation there's some good videos on youtube that demonstrate it, 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 there's various little experiments you can do which are, are great to do with kids to show you how that works um I mean, it's also to do with the, the sort of rotation of spin of the earth so that that bold relaxes it kind of bounces back essentially um, on the other side. Of course, the sun also has an impact on the tide, so which is where we get spring tides and neap tides. So the, the, the sun has, uh, creates a lesser tide. Um, and if, if the sun and the moon line up, you get that spring tide effect where there's a little bit more. Um, and if they're at right angles to each other, they kind of cancel the tides out a little bit and you get that neap tide, which is a very low tide, doesn't change very much. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lag thing to do with spin. Well, that was a rubbish answer. I need to be able to demonstrate that one. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was not, un I was muted then, sorry. That's all right. Uh, amazing, thank you, Paul. So we've got another question from Mark. What will the biggest impact of the moon continuing to move further away from the Earth be? Um, what will the biggest impact be? Well, the tides will slowly move away. As it, it won't always move away. It will eventually settle down. Um, into a, another position um, it will it will move somewhere else and uh, in, in in orbit it'll be a, a, I think it, current thinking is it will look about half the size it does now so it'll, it'll move um, sort of not quite twice as far away essentially but that will mean much lower tides the, the tides will be, you know, the tide is that big. The average tide in the middle of an ocean is about 60, 60 to 80 centimetres. So, uh, which is surprising. It's just because on land, we're on, you know, shallow water, has, it, it creates a bigger effect. But um, as it moves away, the, the, the tides will, will drop. But we're talking about a very, very, very long period of time. Very long period of time before that happens. Okay, so our next question is from Isadora. She says, explain how the moon is slowing the Earth's rotation and how long it will take until the Earth has a 25, 25 hour day. Um, it's that drag thing. So the, um, uh, the, the gravity is dragging on the oceans and the land. Um, so in effect, it's like a sort of gravitational friction. It's, like, it's acting like a bit of a break. So yeah, I mean, Earth's, Earth's days were, were shorter in the past. Earth spun faster. So that's the other thing the, Earth, the, the Moon's done is it, it's sort of slowing us down. Um, in the same way, we've slowed it down. Um, it, it will, I, 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 do you know, I don't actually know how long it would take for a 25 hour day, a very long time. Um, so, because it, it, it's having, it, it's fractions of a second, the effect. But you build that up over thousands, thousands of years, it will you know, slowly build up into another hour. But it's a very long time yet. Um, I'm not sure 
humanity in its current form would be around to to kind of observe it it would um, either we'll have evolved a bit further or we will be somewhere else by then it's a long period of time before we get to, get to that um although the fact that the moon's moving away means that 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 effect is lessening all the time if that makes sense because of course the, the, the gravitational pull of the moon is going to be less so the braking effect is less so we all have a very very long period of time off the top of my head i can't remember how long but it will happen eventually okay we've got a um follow-up from Anne marie barker thanks for your answer following up i was trying to understand if we know any more about some of the impacts on the moon has on earth such as coral blooming at full moon um it's a long it's a period of, i mean I'm not, I'm not a biologist so but it, it is a period of, it's an area of research um it's sort of significant research in many respects we, we, we're still trying to understand a lot of these things um and you know the the moon is very key to a lot of insects we know that, that um uh, interesting the, the milky way is really interesting we've discovered to um beetles um there's a lot of evidence a lot of beetles use the milky way overhead especially in in more equatorial areas that kind of strip of, of stars going across the sky as a navigational aid uh, which is fascinating but so of course light pollution means you can't see the milky way that's having you know all sorts of impacts on on insect life and so the moon the, the moon though is it's it's we know it's key for, for bird migration navigation and um there's, there's all sorts of of subtle biological impacts it has it, it may well have some sort of impact on on humans but certainly um it's nothing to do with births or anything like that that's um the, the amount of human the water in the human body is just not big enough to um, have have the moon kind of have that kind of effect, um, so yeah. Um, but no, it, it's yeah. Coral blooming is a fascinating one. Um, was was sort of discovered the you know the full moon creating all this this coral that blooms that blooms at the same time. So it it, it, um, it, it reproduces. Okay, great. And um, we've got another question, which is going to have to be our last question now. And this is to both Paul and Jill. So what is your opinion on Trump's executive order encouraging the US to mine the moon? Do you think that this will happen? And will this have any impact on the moon itself? It's a really good question. Can you can you hear me? Because I've just unmuted myself. Yeah, okay. Um, Paul, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, you, so this is kind of you carry on. <laughs> Okay, this is kind of my area. So I think just to give a very brief background to people, people don't realize that there's actually a lot of law that governs outer space. And there are five main treaties that have been agreed upon between the different countries around the world. And one of the most important elements of those is to say that outer space is neutral territory and specifically that no nation state may lay sovereign claim to a, a celestial body or celestial territory. And that is something that has been in place since the 1960s. It was starting to be discussed in the 1950s even. So it's been around for a long time. And these treaties really say that basically nobody can own space. If you want an analogy, you can think about the high seas. So in the same way that once you go out a certain distance from, um, um, terra firma, like territory, it becomes neutral. And it's the same, it's meant to be the same for outer space. So it has been quite a big um, discussion within legal communities and with the United Nations and so on. This um, idea that the United States is, seems to be trying to push through um, legislation to allow individual companies to lay claim to celestial territory there are a lot of really quirky legal um issues here so the territory says no nation state may lay sovereign claim to a celestial body some people say therefore a company can and that's where you see like these companies that are selling plots of land on the moon which are not worth your money by the way but um you know, that's that's legally where that comes from. The other thing is this idea that if you extract resources from celestial territory and bring them back to Earth, do they cease to be celestial territory? And so legally, I think the best analogy here is when we look at the high seas and we look at whaling, 
like a certain amount of whaling is allowed to be done um, for scientific purposes. The Apollo missions brought back something like 800 pounds of moon rocks. So we do bring things, resources back from celestial um, visits back to earth. But then the question becomes who owns that? And the international legal infrastructure would suggest that it's, it belongs to the common heritage of mankind. What that means, we don't know. And um, so, yeah, so Trump has really been pushing through this narrative of allowing American companies to legally extract resources. Um, and I think that's under pressure from some companies that are, are, are close-ish to being able to do so. I think we also overestimate the degree to which there are resources that would be really valuable to bring back to Earth. Most resources that I think we would extract would be used in situ. So if we were to mine the moon, for example, we would probably use those resources on a moon base rather than having the expense of bringing them back. But it's still a discussion that we're having. Um, does it mean that it's more likely to go forward? I'm not somebody who believes in what we call technological determinism. So the idea that just because the technology is there and available, that it's going to happen. I think we should still have discussions about whether or not we want it to happen. But the fact of the matter is that we are getting closer to companies partnered with governments being able to extract resources and how we, I would, I personally believe that we shouldn't completely undermine the legal infrastructure that we have in place for outer space, but rather overlay it with um, unpackaging sorts of memorandums of understanding and so on, so that we can find a solution to this that suits both countries and companies um, and individuals but it's it's definitely a live topic and it, it's something that people in my field of international space law are talking a lot about so it's a really good question